to write up. It was uh, my pleasure to actually bring uh, Handel to Seattle when I was a visiting professor that ran the Center for Multicultural Education in 2005 at the UW. And uh, I am so happy to be back in the Northwest to sort of remember the beauty and uh, the greenery. And, uh, the intellectual community is part of that greenery as well. So, um, thanks for the invite and thanks for coming to this talk. And we've got some things we need to talk about. Is my premise. So, um, what I'm going to talk about today, sort of as you break bread, we'll try to break some intellectual bread as well. Okay? Um, is this uh, phenomenon of, of whiteness studies that has kind of broken onto the scene? one could argue in the late 80s, uh, starting with a couple very important uh, publications. Uh, many of you may have read a couple of them, if not all of them, um, Peggy McIntosh's Unpacking the White Knapsack, okay. David Rodiger's Wages of Whiteness, yes, and uh, Ruth Frankenberg's uh, White Women, Race Matters. And so these are circa late 80s, early 90s, these publications. And so, what I'm suggesting is that race scholarship is witnessing a, a certain shift, right? So in the past two decades, so it's not really that old, right? Uh, whiteness studies, which, you know, there are dissertations on whiteness studies, there are professors of whiteness studies. Um, one could argue that there might be departments called whiteness studies. And you might argue, contrary to that, that whiteness studies is, is the official curriculum, so why do we need whiteness studies to begin with? But we'll, we'll take that up as well. So that uh, in the past two decades, uh, whiteness studies has penetrated what arguably has been the home of scholars of color who write for and about people of color. But around the 90s, uh, whiteness studies burst onto the ac academic scene with these three publications that I mentioned, and since then has really witnessed kind of a burgeoning literature. And uh, this uh, represents the beginnings of a focus on whiteness and white experiences. Uh, again, we must note that these aren't necessarily the first to take up whiteness, if you want to broaden that sense. Um, we saw that Du Bois was talking about this already with the souls of black folk, where he does mention the souls of white folk. But it should be noted that scholars of color previously took up the issue of whiteness, but usually as a secondary, if not tertiary, concern. So with whiteness studies, whiteness and white people come to the center in an unprecedented way. This is different from the centering that whiteness is usually afforded in Eurocentric curricula and writing. And so Michael Apple reminds us this, because there is sort of an ironic move in studying whiteness, which might recenter whiteness, which is already one of the problems that we've seen in, in, in both race as a scholarship and race as lived. But I would suggest that this is a sort of new recentering of whiteness, which is to recenter it not in order to valorize it as the rational scientific understanding of the social or life world, but actually as the center of critique. So it, it is to recenter whiteness, but in this sort of new way that we might want to see whiteness as a, in a point of critique and transformation. It, so it, what I'm suggesting is that whiteness studies represents the much neglected anxiety around race, the whiteness scholars. So whiteness studies has been known to be basically an area led by white scholars. And so what does it mean for white scholars and white students to take up whiteness is the question. What does it mean for whites to buy into race consciousness, what is um, their place in a sort of radical, or, you know, sort of revolutionary understanding of, of race. And that begins with understandings of whiteness to them. So what does it mean for white folks since the abolition movement, this is now, we're now entering, I suppose, the second abolitionist movement that I'll talk about. What does it mean for white folks to buy into a race struggle? And I would suggest that whiteness studies is sort of at asking those central questions. Now, the way I'm understanding whiteness studies, it's, it's a both conceptual engagement, but it's also a racial strategy, okay? So it's not just sort of an intellectual exercise, particularly to the abolitionists. It's a racial strategy, and I'll talk about that more. But conceptually, on one side, it poses critical questions about the history, meaning, and ontological status of whiteness. Okay, so that, I wanna focus on the ontological status of whiteness. 
in an essay I'm writing, I'm calling it paleontology, or if you say it, if you say it quickly, it's paleontology. For example, it contains an apparatus for the precise rendering of whiteness's origin as a social category. Okay? And I'll distinguish later about whiteness, whites, and white bodies. Okay? In other words, whiteness is not coterminous with the notion that some people have lighter skin tones than others, which has arguably existed as, you know, as, as people have existed. Along with race, however, it is the central and structural evaluation of skin tone, which invests skin tone with meaning with respect to the overall organization of society. So that's what I'm calling whiteness and race. It's not just the idea that certain bodies are lighter than others, but it's about the sort of justification of the social organization of the life world. Right? So in this sense, whiteness conceptually had to be invented. And there's a pretty good volume you might want to look at by Theodore Allen about the invention of the white race. And um, volume one and two, actually. But whiteness conceptually had to be invented and then reorganized in particular historical conditions as part of its upkeep. So whiteness has to, doesn't have this kind of transcendental meaning, but it, it continually has to be maintained and upkept. Some people are let into the White House, as, as, as I like to say, and some people's keys are sometimes taken away from the White House. So there's sort of movement and um, mobility within that. Um, famous case that Ignatia talks about is uh, Irish. Uh, how Irish became white, uh, preceded by another book called How Jews Became White. So it's, I'm going with the assumption here, uh, along with Monique Wittig, who wrote that one is not born a woman, I would say that one is not born white, and I'll say more about that. Uh, inseparable from the conceptualization of whiteness, whiteness studies comes with certain interventions or racial strategies. There are two significant <coughs> camps that I'm going to be talking about, which is white reconstructionism and white abolitionism. Now, just to summarize quickly, um, Reconstructionists offer uh, discourses and interventions as forms of social practice. Okay, so discourses as forms of social practice that transform whiteness and therefore white people into something other than an oppressive ide ideology and identity. Reconstruction suggests rehabilitating whiteness by re-signifying it through the creation of alternative discourse. So that's where you might get the phrase anti-racist whites. It projects hope onto whiteness by creating new racial subjects out of white people, which are not necessarily ensnared, ensnared by racist logic. On the other hand, white ab abolitionism is guided by Rodiger's famous phrase that whiteness is not only false and oppressive, it is nothing but false and oppressive. Now you might ask yourself, what does that mean? Does that mean I'm only false and oppressive if I'm white? So I'm distinguishing between things like whiteness, white people, and white bodies. So right off the bat, if whiteness is only false and oppressive, it's to be distinguished from white people. Okay, because whiteness in this suggestion is an ideology. It's a position and a choice-making um, part of one's life. So to the extent that you don't have to be white to make your decisions out of whiteness. People of color talk about this all the time. We have names for them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so whiteness is an ideology, a perspective, a worldview, a decision-making process, i.e. whiteness is a choice. Okay. Now, it's not as easy as that. Whites usually choose whiteness, right? There's a preponderance here. But we may choose, there's, it's not sort of determinist, the analysis, is that whites can make other choices in life that are not guided by whiteness. They could be guided by otherness. Okay? One, it, it's, it's full of contradictions, of course. So the abolitionist movement early on might have done that, but they were also ensnared in their whiteness and how, people guide, um, how people's opinions on them were guided as well. So we had an internal contradiction, a racial contradiction in the abolitionist movement who thought they were doing the right thing, of course, but then they um, had conflict with people like Frederick Douglass and other people of color that uh, didn't make it so simple. So in opposition to reconstructing whiteness, abolishing whiteness sees no redeeming aspects of whiteness. And as long as white people think that they are white, James Baldwin <coughs> once opined that there is no hope for them. Okay. So this presentation will consider these two perspectives or frameworks. Now, 
Neo-abolitionists argue that whiteness is a center of the race problem. As long as whites and whiteness exists, little racial progress will be made. In fact, Noel Ignatiev argues that multiculturalism without the uptake, the critical uptake of whiteness and general race theories that don't do this and that accept the existence of races are problematic for their naturalization of what are otherwise reified concepts. So to Ignatiev, races are not real in an objective and an ontological sense, and therefore whites, for example, are not real either. This is part of his and their intervention. He does not go so far as suggesting that white people, white people do not exist, right? Which is different, which is a different point. Furthermore, the investment in whiteness, the, the wonderful phrase we get from George Lipsitz, is the strongest form of investment because it is the most privileged racial identification. And as long as whites invest in whiteness, the existence of the non-white races will also continue. So that's one premise of the study of whiteness, is that it is the strongest, most, strong, uh, most um, crucial form of racial investment, which is kind of ironic and odd in a colorblind era where whites kind of disabusing themselves, have been disabusing themselves, of the identity of whiteness. So apparently whites are just individuals, right? And that's very popular to say now. It's, uh, the, the colorblind era kind of disallows us to, in public spaces especially, to talk about race in sort of overt terms. And so whites are usually at the forefront of that because usually being called white is, is an uncomfortable place to be. And there's also benefits to making whites invisible. Now, the clarion call for abolitionists asks whites to disidentify with whiteness, leading to the eventual abolition of whiteness. I would also add, in the literature you might notice, and I'm added to this in the Souls of White Folk, that this abolition of whiteness wasn't exactly equated with the abolition of white people. Now, if you imagine that, and I think it would probably be a right imagination, that the whiteness studies literature is led by white scholars, there was something kind of ironic for them to suggest the abolition of white people. It's to, to abolish oneself, right? But to, to my understanding, if you sort of undercut the category of whiteness, which the identity of white people depends on, you are, in effect, undercutting the concept of white people. And so my recent understanding is that to abolish whiteness is to abolish white people. Okay? Now that's, that's different from white bodies, right? White bodies will still exist, but we will no longer consider them white people. I'll get into this a little more. But I'm trying to distinguish between whiteness, an ideology, white people, an identity, and white bodies, which is some kind of literal understanding there that then we graph the meaning of white people onto, right? But if you undercut whiteness as an ideology, one that a lot of the abolitionists suggest is parasitic, right? And it's an ideology that white people really depend on. But if we give white people an option out of that, and it's not just sort of words, right? It's sort of structural transformations. Um, then what I'm suggesting is that it also signals the withering away of white people. If you can imagine, we didn't have white people anyway about, let's say, 600 years ago. So the suggestion by abolitionists is you, we made white people. So one is not born white by virtue of having a white body. One has to be taught to be white. And there are many signals both in our home and in our schools of how whites are taught as young children to be white. And usually that means in opposition to the non-white, usually black. Okay, So white, according to um, Ignatiev and people like Rodiger, is kind of a very negative identity and negative signifier to the extent that it is only what it is not, and what it tries to suppress and repress, which is the other. Okay. Now, it might seem strange to you that white folks may find this quite controversial to suggest not being white anymore. It's ironic and controversial because in a colorblind era, white folks already don't buy into their whiteness. So why would it be so um, unsettling to suggest to white folks that you not be white anymore when most white folks go through daily life by assuming they're not white anyway, <laughs> right? Well, I suppose one answer to that is that white people know that they're white, right? But we talk as if 
and this includes people of color too sometimes, but we talk as if they don't know they're white. We, we talk about whites as being ignorant of race, okay? Not knowledgeable, not having grown up with the discourse in their home. Now this has certain problems about the innocence of whiteness, right? Because we also know just from personal experience that if a white person took a non-white person home as a date, everything changes, right? To bring home a friend who's non-white, everything changes. So in some at least lived way, whites already know that they're white. And that may, that may explain why there's sort of this defensive reaction towards abolishing whiteness and abolishing white people. Because there is an investment. Okay? So color blindness isn't necessarily such a literal process of being blind to color. It's about feigning being blind to color. Because in a completely racialized globe, how do you not see race? Is the question here. How do you not see race? It's right in front of you. And we know during critical events um, in our lives that raceness of whites is put in front of them and they have to deal with it, such as uh, you know, interracial dating and marriage, some of the very most racialized um, events in our lives. Okay. Now, of course, uh, white reconstructionists would uh, argue with this disappearance of whiteness. Okay? They would rather um, recover it, and the disagreement falls within two domains, theory and viability. Okay? Theoretically, reconstructions do not agree with Rodiger's maxim, right? That whiteness is only false and oppressive because there are many examples of white, such as the first abolitionists, and including the neo-abolitionists, I would call them, who have fought against racism, Reconstructionists argue that whites can be remade, revisioned, and re-signified, more importantly, and are not hopelessly and merely racist. Their search is for a re-articulated form of whiteness that reclaims its identity for racial justice. They acknowledge that whiteness is a privilege but that whites can use this privilege for purposes of racial justice and therefore contribute to the remaking of whiteness that is not inherently oppressive and false. So it's about rehabilitating, resignifying, rearticulating, unthinking, remaking, etc. Reconstructing whiteness includes focusing on white historical figures like in schools who have fought and still fight against racial oppression. So one of the Suggestions here is that white kids need to see, white students need to see examples of white people in whiteness that was um, examples that are working against racism. Okay, that too often um, there's this kind of reductive notion in history textbooks and the literature that whites are um, inherently and hopelessly oppressive. Reconstru and so that's theoretically the point here, but uh, Reconstructionists also have a sort of viability question, which is they consider this strategy as more viable than arguing for the abolition of whiteness, a discourse that most, uh, I already mentioned, that most whites will probably have a difficult time accepting. The discourse of white abolition will only lead to white defensiveness and retrenchment and does not represent much hope for even progressive or anti-racist whites. To the Reconstructionists, Abolitionism is tantamount to promoting a certain self-hatred, shame, and guilt among whites. Rather, they prefer to instill critical hope in whites. The question still remains, you know, what to do with whiteness is my, is my uh, question for today. So some concepts that I'm already focusing on are whiteness, white people, white bodies. Um, how do you whites enter into a racial discourse, a racial struggle, and what is their place within it? Because that's what the whiteness studies folks are asking us. And I'm also going to implicate and ask you certain things, uh, certain questions to think about, which is whiteness's relationship with capitalism, which I'm gonna speak to as well. are all going to be direct quotes from authors that I think <coughs> represent one or two 
one of the two sides. So, so these are Giroux's question, right? Because he finds that our current understandings of whites and whiteness is a reductive understanding, an essentialist moment that reduces whites and whiteness to just merely oppressive. So he's asking us certain questions about complexifying the category. Okay. What subjectivities can we point to that already exist that can then project some hope onto whiteness and white folks? And one of those that's key to Kinchel and Steinberg is this critical pedagogy of whiteness that is positive, proud, attractive, anti-racist, travels in and out of uh, circles with confidence and empathy. So there's, there's this really, there's this real concern about what to do with our white students and white young people. And you might ask, why, why, what's this <coughs> self-indulgence in whiteness studies that asks the questions of, you know, forget about you, now let's talk about me. Um, it is, it, it can be very, it can be very ironic to suggest that whiteness studies that focuses on the sort of struggles of white students is sort of revolutionary because isn't it supposed to be about the other and the oppressed? But uh, I think what they're suggesting is it, it, it's sort of a relationship and it's key that white uh, students and young people buy into a more sort of proud, uh, empathetic, uh, whiteness. Now you can say that whites already travel in and out of various ethnic circles with confidence. I suppose that uh, we already call that donning on the other, right? Wearing <laughs> hip hop and that uh, there's a sort of exoticization of the other that whites already enter into. So I suppose the key here is the empathy part. Okay, That would be the addition. But the other part with the confidence already kind of exists in urban settings particularly. Okay. So that their critique in traditional forms of multiculturalism is that it really doesn't have this space right, for whites to buy into as white subjects, to enter the race struggles as whites. Because a lot of how it comes across to Kishlow and Steinberg is that whites have to forget their whiteness. And that they have to buy into blackness, they have to buy into alterity in order to sort of join the struggle. But they're looking for a space where whites can be white and enter the struggle as we formed or transformed whites. <clears throat> and part of that means really focusing on the complexity of whiteness rather than a reductive notion of it. That there are many ways to be white is the concept here. That whites are working class, middle class, even bourgeois. Uh, whites are women, men, gay, lesbian. Etc. And so this complexification then prevents us from sort of essentializing whites as only and hopelessly oppressive and racist because they are at the matrix of relations of domination but also can be on the receiving end due to multiple identities. Okay? So that Ellsworth particularly says, and it's, it's a very nice sentence, which is white is more than one thing and never the same thing twice. It's a, whiteness is a bit of a river. That every time you touch the river, take your hand, your finger out, touch it again, you're touching a different part of the river that has already moved. Okay? So this is the search for the non-essentialized white. The importance of multiple positionalities, but from McIntyre, who herself studied and made meaning of whiteness, and by studying whiteness, she herself claims to have been transformed. And there's the side of it that we need to talk about, which is the sort of practice and political viability of Reconstructionism that Kinshaw and Steinberg are talking about. Again, it's not very strategic to them to sort of confront whites about this white racist legacy. And to Giroux, it's much more important to focus on whiteness than white racism, for example, because then it uh, avoids this kind of defensiveness about uh, the legacy of racism. Now, you might want to question the idea that, you know, just because it's 
just because people feel defensive about something doesn't mean that it won't work. Right? Men are defensive about patriarchy. That doesn't mean that we don't attack it, right? And so that's the question here is just because something offends or, you know, offends one's sensibility doesn't mean that um, it won't work or that it isn't the preferred route. So the, the question here is more pra practical or pragmatic, and I think the ab abolitionists will have something to say about this in a second. So it is hard to imagine that a, a mass movement of whites are going to buy into the notion that you abolish your, your whiteness. But that never suggested that anything important was going to be easy. Okay? So the abolitionists would like to take this up. And that's where I'm going to go next. So did the white abolitionists race discussions and race scholarship has been dogged, have been dogged by sort of the absence of whiteness studies in it. So to them, and you know, that's Ignatia, Rodiger, et cetera, any race movement that doesn't involve or critically bring into the fold a study of whiteness is doomed in some way to fail. Because to them, the point of studying race is to ask questions about its, its privileged signifier, privileged position, et cetera, and that's where you go and attack it. And so their, their, center, their center is the notion of looking at whiteness and the white race. And that really butts up against a lot of traditional race theory, which was to focus on the experiences of people of color. And to them, the point is not to interpret whiteness. And it's, this sounds like the old injunction or um, critique by Marx on uh, a thesis on Feuerbach which is that it, the point is not to interpret whiteness, but to abolish it. It sounds like the point is not to describe history, but to change it. Right? So they, have, they question even the idea of race. So it's, it wouldn't be uncommon to see the abolitionists putting race in quotation marks, which we might have certain questions about, because they don't think it's real, but at the same time, they might not think other things are real, maybe let's say religion, but they might not put that in a quotation mark. But they'll put race in a quotation mark. So I think there's some things we might want to talk about as far as you, you know, the, act, the action of putting quotation marks around certain concepts. Okay? So they question even the viability of anti-racism because anti-racism proposes the existence, the, uh, the sort of reality of race. And to them, uh, re, re, race is completely socially constructed. Right? And that the more we talk, the more we narrate it, the more we reify it. So they're trying to get away from this notion um, about race, and they don't like to no normally use it um, in the literature. Okay? They do like to talk about racism, but the idea of race to them is an ideological reified concept that we, re that we would do better staying away from. Okay? And that includes whites, whiteness, etc., and all the racial terms that go with race. Okay. So they're asking us to dissolve the white race. Okay. And they're asking whites particularly to ask certain questions about, is it worth it to be white anymore? Okay. Particularly, Rodiger is good at this because he is a labor historian. Ignatia uh, is more kind of centrally uh, race or whiteness scholar, but it's Rodiger who asks questions about working class whites, and I'll get into that a little more in a second. Because what it is, is to the extent that you have the denigration of white working class folks, the suffering, the sort of lack of education, the lack of health um, programs for them, the lack of uh, power, etc., um, he's concerned that a, a class struggle it really isn't going to get the white working class to where they need to go. Because part of their contradiction is that they are racialized working class people. And this kind of, you know, I don't know if you've seen Chris Rock's um, concert in Washington, D.C., where he jokes a little. He's joking, but he's dead serious. And I think we can learn something from this, this joke, um, which is uh, he's asking, there's some people in the audience, he says, some of you in the audience are white. And some of you may actually even be poor, but you will never trade your spot 
with a rich man, with a black man like me, and Intise says, I'm rich, you know? And so I think what Rodiger is asking is about the contradiction of the white working class, which is that they're using race, their whiteness, as a way of coping with their denigrated material lives, right? Their low um, health rate, et cetera, sort of from health to wealth, right? And so he's asking, white working class particularly to consider the racial struggle as they're out of the class struggle or, or as they're you know getting out of that oppression because one of the contradictions they face is they're going to ride this white train even if, even if it means living this denigrated life now you and i may suggest that there's you know if you even things out that uh, there are public and psychological wages to being white even if you're poor that blacks and other people of color don't have those uh, public and psychological wages. But he's actually looking at that intersection here of what maintains white working class oppression and what can get them out of it is this coping strategy of at least I'm white. And he's bringing that into question. Okay? So that the white working class sort of, let's say, Marxist or socialist struggle is bound up inextricably bound up with a racial struggle. And as long as there is no sort of race discussion within the white working class movement, it is bound to fail, or at least is disingenuous. This, I like this, you know, this was a speech by, uh, by Nasha, actually at UC Berkeley at one point. Right? They're, you know, they're, they're really challenging the Reconstructionists by this uh, passage. Right? They're asking, is what you're saying merely a discursive strategy because we don't find any examples of positive iterations of whiteness? Now, you may ask yourself, wait a minute, there are abolitionists who are whites, there are people today, there are people in the civil rights movement who are whites. Now, I suppose the way they're making sense of it is that when whites go against racial oppression, they are undoing whiteness and arguably themselves. So not all decisions that whites make, going back to my original point earlier, not all decisions that whites make are within the whiteness as an ideology framework. Right? But when whites make their decisions, and people of color make their decisions, out of whiteness, the results are predictable. We have enslavement, genocide, discrimination, labor, um, market discrimination segregation. These are all the examples of whiteness that we know as suggested by Ignatia. And there is no example to, to the contrary. But when whites do make their decisions out of otherness, that's different to them. That's not just whiteness. That's concrete white people making concrete decisions. And those decisions aren't necessarily guided, again, by an ideology of whiteness. That's, I think, very important to point out. So that whiteness may be false and oppressive, but there's a space here where we can say that white people are not just false and oppressive. Okay, they can make certain decisions that are guided by something else. So that's a, that's a very good question to ask Reconstructionism, is what are the examples? Other than it would be nice you know, for whites to be anti-racist, it would be nice to uh, re-articulate whiteness. They're asking, show us some examples of where whiteness has been a positive force not white people. So I think what we can tease out of this is an overt attempt to theorize whiteness and white people that I think is helpful to disaggregate them. Right? And so that's why I'm coming up with this recent understanding that to abolish whiteness is to abolish white people. And that's very uncomfortable, perhaps, but it asks about our definitions of what race is and what racial justice might mean. Okay? So again, Rodiger is asking the same question here about this genuine class unity is not going to happen because within it are these cleavages of racial struggles and gender struggles that prevent class unity from sort of happening and prevents white working class folks from achieving their goal. So the upshot is race treason, okay? which, as we saw from Kinchlow and Steinberg, is not what they are promoting. Okay? That what is this 
betrayal of one's family. And I mean by family literally, there's that great scene in American History X, right, with Ed Norton sitting at the table with his parents, and they're talking about black folks, and there's this loyalty to the family, the white family, in both the literal sense of the family and in a larger sense of big W, big F family, okay? And so they're asking, what is it that whites currently do? How is it that you signify and signal, that is, your loyalty to the white nation? And they're asking that this be broken, okay? And what did Baldwin mean when he said, as long as you think you're white, there's no hope for you, right? I think he's asking that um, whiteness and being white isn't sort of a given fact. Uh, you know, if, uh, if uh, Fanon were still, he might talk about the fact of whiteness. But I think this is sort of a complication of that, which is the notion that um, because you think you're white, you're also acting according to those discourses of how you construct yourself as white and recognize others as white. So there's this kind of, you know, sometimes we talk about people of color as having some kind of secret handshake. There's a, there's a kind of, and so, sometimes literally there is a handshake. Um, but there's also a white handshake, I think, is what's being kind of metaphorized here, is that how whites kind of notice and signal to each other and sort of uh, recognize each other as belonging to the white nation. So we can talk about white nationalism because nationalism often gets talked about as something about people of color. But if there's any possessive investment that we have seen that's strongest, it's white nationalism as suggested by this. And they're asking you to you know, commit treason to this na na nationalism. But as you commit treason to this nationalism, you are then claiming loyalty to humanity because one of the obstructions to a full human development for whites is this buying into the sort of pr a pursuit of the white whale. Okay. But that sits very uncomfortably for even liberal whites because what does it mean to leave home? A lot of people of color know what that means, to leave home and to sort of be between two places as Du Bois called it, a double consciousness. And I'm not going so far as to suggest whites are going to have double consciousness now. It's a, it's a bit more complicated than that. But what does it mean to be betray one's own group? But as you betray your group, you are becoming more loyal to the human family. That's what they're suggesting. So again, we go to that question I asked earlier, which is, is it worth, is it, worth it to be white anymore? Whites are confessing their confusion. Okay? Whether it's really worth the effort, oh, sorry, to, to be white, we need to say that it's not worth it and that many of us do not want to do it. Exposing how whiteness is used to make whites settle. Again, that coping strategy. He's particularly talking about working class whites. I think he's not talking about whites in general settling. But it's poor whites who are settling for their hopelessness in politics and their misery in everyday life. Okay? So, the question is, in light of that misery, is it worth it to be white anymore? White women also hang on to this whiteness to the extent that that contradicts their own ability to then form alliances with women of color. And as white women do uh, suffer this, de you know, this um, demeaning lifestyle, it's contradicted by their own racial loyalty to the white na um, nation. And I think the same question could be posed to white women in different kinds of um, themes that we could pose, but is it also worth it for white women to be white anymore? I mean, they're committed, uh, Ignatia and Garvey are committed particularly to this notion that if given these options in a realistic way, whites would choose, I think what they're saying is the moral choice here. But it has to be in some ways convenient because currently it's very inconvenient for whites to argue for abolition because of its contradictions. And what, what will whites be afterwards? We can 
perhaps talk about that in our discussion. What will it mean to be post-white? Okay, which I think implicates a lot of other things we can talk about, such as what what does it mean for the other? What does it mean for race? Right? If whiteness is the anchor of race, and we abolish whiteness, what does that mean for others? And what does that mean for a race formation, a racial organization of our society? Okay. So that. Uh, Again, to pose the question, what does it mean to, for the conceptual death of whiteness and for the death of white people? Okay. Um, you've, a lot of you may read the post literature, you know, the post is that column, and it's a very common to talk about the death of the subject. What does it mean to talk about the death of the white subject? Um, what is the autonomy of race in this discussion? If it's linked up to modes of production like capitalism, what does it mean to talk about the intersection of race and capitalism, or race and multiple modes of production, such as Cuba. Right? Do you have a form of <coughs> communist racism, for example? If the assumption about race and class is that if you get rid of capitalism, racism will go away, what does it mean in our social experiment in Cuba that's going on, where they do still have race? And maybe we can talk about race existing in multiple modes of production, and not easily explainable as a reflex of a capitalist mode of production. Okay. What does it mean for race mixing as the, um, as Hirschman suggests, this miscegenation that's being, he's saying it's going up, and the sort of immigration that's coming into this country and others that really kind of complexifies our notion of race, and as the race is mixed, is this signifying the, the end of race and whiteness? Sort of perhaps the Brazilian example um, that we saw earlier in the century, though we, we know from the literature they have their race problem. So just to pose for our discussion, what does it mean to be after whiteness and after the quote unquote race transformation or revolution? What will whites be? What will other people, people of color that is, what will we be? And what does that mean for a sort of an educational process to bring children up for this possibility. It's not something that anybody here is posing is going to happen in, in, in a decade. But at least the possibility that we can talk about, what, what, would, what would it mean to sort of pose the possibility of a post-race formation? Some people call it, for example, and to end with, you know, a society beyond the color line. So, thanks, and I look forward to our discussion. Thanks very much, uh, Zeus, for um, uh, a very interesting and, and I'm sure uh, 